Okay, I welcome all the attendees uh, in this uh, webinar series by distinguished experts being jointly organized by the National Academy of Sciences India Delhi chapter and MHRD Institution Innovation Council in Jalupadhyay College University of Delhi. And today we have uh, Professor Philip Nenny who will be talking about uh, are we there yet? How do cells find their way? Well, uh, this webinar series is the fourth which we have today and uh, as a customary I'll introduce uh, Professor Philip uh, who received his BA in mathematics from Loyal College Oxford in 1982 and his DPhil in 1985 under the supervision of Professor J.D. Murray. In 1988 he was appointed assistant professor in the mathematics department of the University of Ottawa, Salt Lake City. In 1990 he returned to Oxford as a university lecturer and in 1998 was appointed professor of mathematical biology by recognition of distinction and the director of the WCMB. In 2005, he was appointed statutory professor of mathematical biology. He has been an elected member of the boards of the Society for, Society for Mathematical Biology and European Society for Mathematical and Theoretical Biology. He is a fellow of the IMA, ASEAN fellow, and inaugural SMB fellow, a fellow of the Royal Society of Biology. In 2015, he was elected fellow of the Royal Society, and in 2017, he was elected fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences and a foreign fellow of INSA, that is Indian National Science Academy. His present research projects include the modeling of avascular and vascular tumors, normal and abnormal wound healing, and a number of applications of mathematical modeling in pattern formation in early development, as well as the theoretical analysis of the mathematical models that arise in all these applications. He has over 300 publications in the field and has held visiting positions at a number of universities worldwide. In 2009, he was awarded the LMS Naylor Prize and Lectureship, and in 2014, he was the world's most influential scientific mind 2014 by Thomson Writers. In 2017, he was awarded the Arthur T. Wintry Prize from the Society of Mathematical Biology. I welcome uh, Professor Philip and would like him to share his screen. So shall I start? Yeah, please, please. Oh, okay, so um, thank you, uh, Manoj, for that um, uh, very kind introduction, and thank you for the invitation to give uh, this talk. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how cells find their way in for them to go to where they need to go. So um, collective cell migration is very, very common in biology. For example, so I just need to move this out of the way. Um, in normal development, in many cases, cells emerge in certain areas in the body, and then they have to go to some other area in the body, and they have to do that as a collective. And if that doesn't happen, then diseases can occur, developmental diseases can occur. When we get a wound, like a cut, then there are no cells there. So cells have to move collectively in and close the wound. So we have repair. And then disease in things like cancer, there are there's the phenomenon of collective cell movement. So a question in all of these is how do cells communicate with each other? so that they can move collectively to where they want to be. So in this talk, I'm going to look at two, what at the beginning looks like very, very different examples of collective cell movement, but what we will see is they're very, very similar. So one will be cranial neurocrest migration, and I'll explain that in a few minutes. And the other will be the formation of new blood vessels, which is a process that occurs in, um, develop, in uh, um, wound healing and also occurs in tumor growth, solid tumor growth. So let's begin with looking at cranial neural crest migration. This is work that's been ongoing for almost 10 years now with Paul Kalesa and Rebecca McLennan, who are at medical are researchers at the Stowers Institute for Medical Research, 
and with colleagues in the mathematics department in Oxford, Ruth Baker, and in Comlab, David Kay, and with a student, Louise Dyson, who's now faculty at Warwick, Linus Schumacher, who's now faculty at Edinburgh, and Raza Inuati, who is presently in Oxford. So what are neural crest? Well, basically, neural crest, there's more than one neural crest, and these are transient embryonic structures that arrive in, arise in vertebrates, and they give rise to lots of different organs and structures in the body. And the one we'll be looking at is cranial neural crest. And in particular, we'll be looking at the neural crest that give rise to this part of the body. So typically what happens is in early development, here is the neural tube down here, and you can see here different cross sections. Cells from the neural tube migrate towards where they need to go. So you can see here in this cross section, cells start here, they need to migrate all the way down to here, which is of course called the branchial arches. And the reason why we choose to look at cranial neural crest is because that proper migration is crucial for normal development of the face and neck. And if this doesn't work properly, then there are um, abnormalities that develop. Moreover, the cranial neural crest are very similar in behavior to highly aggressive cancers, such as melanoma, neuroblastoma, and therefore we, we argue that if we can understand normal development, then we can understand abnormal development, which is how you can consider cancer. Moreover, this system is experimentally tractable, which means it can be manipulated and you can test exper you can test theories. And it's a powerful paradigm for um, collective cell migration. So this is just a slide to show that we can get a lot of data. And so, for example, down here, what we see is that during the process of migration, the domain is actually growing. So here is the length of the domain here, and it starts off at roughly speaking 300 microns, and it goes up to roughly speaking 1200 microns in about a day. And this movement is happening, and this growth is happening on this curved surface. So before I talk about cranial neural crest, I just want to mention one of the other neural crests in which the process of collective movement is, is different to the one we're going to talk about. And this is in the gut. So in the gut, um, as the gut is growing, the intestine is growing, the neural crest cells are invading the gut to cover and line the, um, the, the intestine. And if they don't move and cover it quickly enough, part of the gut is left unlined, and that leads to abnormalities. Here is a drawing of the abnormality. You get enlarged colon, and this obviously can lead to difficulties. And it's not, and it, it's natural to assume that if these cells are not reaching the end of the domain in time, there must be something wrong with the movement. But a few years ago, Kerry Landman and Matt, and Matt Simpson, who are mathematicians, working with Don Newgreen, who's a biologist, were able to show that in fact, cell division, in other words, proliferation, plays a very important role in this movement. And you end up getting a reaction diffusion equation 
which is called the Fisher KPP equation. And you can show there that the motion depends not the movement of the wave of invasion of cells depends equally on diffusion and proliferation. So this disease may not be a disease of movement, it could be a disease of proliferation. So back to the cranial neural crest, and in our example, the neural crest cells undergo very little division, proliferation during the process of invasion. So it can't be driven by proliferation and movement in the way that it's done in the gut. So a natural thing to think about is that it's done by just random movement. The cells move randomly and they reach the end. A very simple calculation shows that that simply would take far too long. You'd not be able to cover that distance in a day. So the next idea is that the movement must be a biased random walk, must be directed. Now it's known that the covering of the tissue produces a chemoattractant, a chemical called VEGF, and this chemical is consumed by the cells, and if it's consumed by the cells as the cells are coming from the neural tube, that will create a gradient. And it's known that this VEGF is a chemoattractant, which means that cells move up that chemical gradient. And so you have a directed movement. So the question, so that the first hypothesis from the experimentalist was that this is what leads to the invasion. So we decided to check that. So we started off with the model. So remember, the movement is on a curved surface, in a curved domain, I should say. So we're going to simplify that and consider it as being flat. The depth is about three cell diameters, much less than the breadth. So we're going to squash it down and consider it as being a flat rectangle. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a reaction diffusion equation, PDE, for the VEGF, where we'll have a source term, we'll have diffusion, and we will have a sink where the cells eat, consume the VEGF. And of course, we need boundary conditions because these cells are moving along in a corridor in a directed movement. They're not moving wide. When we started this work, we didn't know biologically what the boundary conditions should be. So in part of the work, we looked at homogeneous Priestley boundary conditions. We set the um, VEGF to be zero on the boundaries. Later on, we looked at zero flux boundary conditions. And this was um, inspired by work in the frog in Xenopus, where it's known that there is a chemical that inhibits cell movement in um, the lateral direction. It turns out, in fact, that the results that we get for our model, they're independent of these boundary conditions. It doesn't matter which boundary condition you use. We're going to, because there are a small number of cells, we're going to consider them as discrete entities that stochastically sense the gradient. So they look in a few directions measure the chemical concentration, compare it with the chemical concentration at their center of gravity, and if the chemical concentration further away is bigger, they move in that direction with constant speed. And these cells 
exclude each other, they have a volume, so they don't go on top of each other. And this is the simplest way in which you can set up a cell-induced chemical gradient system. So mathematically, if C is the chemotractant, here is the diffusion term where length is in the x direction, we assume that there's not much growth in the y direction. This term here is production of the chemical, and this comes from uh, deriving the um, PDE diffusion equation on the growing domain. You get this extra term here, dilution term, where L is the length, where we just choose this to fit that growth profile that our experimental colleagues found. And this is just the sink term. Basically, all this is saying is that if a cell has center xi, yi, then um, it will consume with maximum cons consumption at xi, yi, but the consumption will tail off as we move away. So I will not show the video of this because just in case it doesn't work. So we try this. We have the, um, here is the domain with VEGF. The domain grows. Cells come into the domain. They sense the gradient. They move up the gradient and they consume the chemical. So the chemical gets small. So you can see going from here to here, it looks quite good. The cells are invading. Problem is that this gradient is very narrow. It's localized. So later cells get left behind and we don't get invasion. So this simple hypothesis we show mathematically doesn't work. So now we ask the question, well, what signal do these, chem do these cells see? And we thought, well, they see cells ahead of them. So could it be the case that maybe they attach to a cell ahead of them and then they just follow that cell? So what we did was we encoded in the model two cell types. Cells at the front, which we call leaders, who would move up the chemical gradient. And then cells at the back, we call them followers, who would simply follow the leaders. And then we get this happens. You see, you get movement. And you get the movement in the tracks, which is observed experimentally. So our model prediction then was that the cells at the front are different to the cells at the back. So we went to our experimental collaborators and we asked them, are the cells different at the front to the back? And they said, we don't know, but we'll find out. We'll do, we'll do some analysis of the cells. And they did analysis of the cells, and they found significant difference in gene expressions between the front and the back. In fact, what they found was that the leading cells upregulate cells that are associated with breaking down the material, extracellular matrix material that the body has to allow them to invade, while the cells at the back express genes that make them stick. So it's exactly what the mathematical model predicted. But it's more complicated than that. It turns out that if you look all along the track of cells moving, you find different gene expression. It's not just two different expressions, it's a graded difference of expression. 
So it's more complicated than the model suggested. So what we've been doing with our colleagues over the past few years is we've been um, using our mathematical model. We meet with our colleagues. We decide what experiments can they do in the lab that we can do on the computer. Then we do these independently of each other. Then we meet and we see what were the, the experimental results, what were the mathematical predictions. So here's a number of experimental results which agreed with the model. I'm going, only going to, for the interest of time, present one such example. So here's an example, the question of what would happen if you took away some of the followers. So here's the experiment. This is normal cell movement and normally how you'd see the cells in blue and this is what happens when you do the experiment the cells now in pink are over a larger domain the the front cells are over a larger domain here's the model result we take the cells at the back away and these cells spread up so a number of other experiments where the mathematical model and the experiment in the chick agree. But I'm going to instead now switch to what I think is more interesting is when the experiment disagrees with the model. So here's an example here where what would happen if we took the followers from a donor and put them right at the front of a host. And here's the result. Again, blue is what would happen normally. The um, pink is the experiment. And what you see here is the cells that you put at the front, they start to invade. Now, our model doesn't produce that because our model says the cells you put at the front are followers, so they don't detect gradient, so they don't move. So obviously, that assumption that the cell state or the phenotype is fixed in a cell is wrong. When these cells move into an area where there's lots of chemical, they move in response to the chemical. They become leaders. So question now is, how does that switch? Can we look at the consequences of that switch? So here's an experiment in which actually you don't need a mathematical model to figure out the result. You can just use common sense. Suppose the cells are moving along and we put some veg F along the trail. What will happen? Well, the cells that are very far away, they'll continue moving up the gradient. The followers coming along suddenly are now in a state of very large veg F. So they will become leaders and will move up this other gradient of veg F. So you'll get a splitting of the two of the of the um, trail into two. And that's the model done here. You get this, it splits. And this is the experiment. Here's the VEGF. These cells stop here while these continue to go. So another question our experimental colleagues asked us was how many leaders are necessary for this invasion? Now, the problem is that with this model, the parameters are very roughly estimated. So we cannot make precise predictions of how many leaders are necessary, 
but we can make predictions on what would happen if you change the number of leaders. So here is a model experiment where we say, what would happen if you increase the number of leaders? So here, the leaders are in orange, the followers are in purple. And what we see here, if you increase the leaders, so there's more orange here, you still reach the end of the domain, but you've got fewer cells. If we add up, integrate laterally and plot along the track, what we see happening here, this is number of cells, this is normal, and this is if you increase the number of leaders. So you still reach the end, but fewer cells. Here's the experiment. This is the control normal. And this is an experiment in which they upregulated something called HAN2. And that makes more leaders. And you see, you get invasion, but fewer leaders. Exactly what the model predicted. But note the numbers. Here, 8 is the scale. Here, 16. So we get qualitative prediction, but not quantitative, but we didn't expect quantitative behavior, quantitative prediction. So if we now move back to the model, what we can see here in our leader follower model is some leaders are actually quite far away. So they can't signal to the followers. So our model might break down if the leaders move too fast away. So there must be something that stops the leaders from moving so far away. So our biology colleagues started to look to see whether such a thing existed. And then, and they found something called DAD. And here's some, here's some um, pictures here, experimental pictures here. This red stuff is DAN. And it's expressed right where the cells are next to the neural tube. But as the cells move through DAN, the expression of DAN goes down. And so here, for example, you see that the expression is totally gone. What does Dan do? Here's an experiment where they put strips of Dan and then normal. Strip of Dan, normal. And they looked at, as the cells come out here, how many go on the Dan and how many stay off the Dan. What you can see here is there's a significant decrease in the number of cells that go on to the DAN. DAN turns out to be a BMP inhibitor. So if you add BMP, you recover the movement. Now, remember I told you that one of the reasons for looking at these neural crest behavior is their behavior is very similar to melanoma. And so this DAN we've just seen stop or slows the cells down. So what our colleagues did was confront melanoma cells with Dan, and you get the same result. It reduces the invasion of this highly aggressive cancer. So there's an example of understanding how normal development is controlled, is giving us some insights how to deal with abnormal behavior, like in cancer. So in all of this work, we've considered the domain growing uniformly in, in space and just changing in time. We had a discussion with our colleague Hans Othmer, and he asked us, why are you making that assumption? Maybe the domain in space is also growing non-uniformly. So our experimental colleagues checked this, and in fact, that's what happens. 
So our assumption that we have spatially uniform growth is, to, is a simplification. It's actually non-uniform in growth. So what we've been doing here is using our mathematical model to say if you have different growth dynamics, so for example, here, this, this part of the domain is growing a lot, this part of the domain not growing so much. Here, um, or maybe here, this part grows a lot, this part doesn't grow so much. How does that affect movement? And what you can see that there are some growth profiles in which the invasion is not really affected that much. See here and see here, but there's a difference from here to here. So there's a certain robustness to the growth dynamics. So the conclusion that we've come to here in something that at the outset seemed quite a simple problem, how do you get a group of cells moving into a domain to move in a nice uniform way to the end of the domain? It turns out it's not very simple. You need a number of things. You need a polarity, a bias, to move in that direction, in the correct direction. You need to have interactions between the cells to pass the signal along the track, which means that the cells have to be different. One needs to be able to pass a signal, the other one needs to be able to read the signal. You need to control the cells at the front so they don't move too fast. And you need to worry about the growth dynamics of the domain. And this idea of leaders and followers occurs in many different contexts. It occurs in animal movement, it occurs in social sciences, and it also occurs in tumour dynamics. And that leads me on to the second part of this talk, which is angiogenesis. So in wound healing, let's do wound healing first. Um, when there's a wound and you bleed, it means that your blood vessels have been destroyed. So new blood vessels form, and that process is called angiogenesis. And this is a process that um, happens in tumour cells. And this work is work done with my colleague Helen Byrne and the former student Samara Pillay. So here's a cartoon. Here is a tumour growing. And then because a tumour is um, overpopulated and metabolically inefficient, it runs out of oxygen. When cells run out of oxygen, they signal to the vasculature so that the vasculature will start to grow towards the tumour. And the signal they send, one of the signals is VEGF, the one we've just been talking about. And they send other signals. These signals diffuse to the nearest blood vessels, cause the blood vessel to become unstable and split, and then the cells of the blood vessel move up the chemical gradient of VEGF towards the tumour, and then infiltrate the tumour, join up, and form vasculature. So we have cells moving in response to VEGF, just like in the neural crest. So where is the leader follower aspect of this? Well, the cells at the front, which are called tip cells, here, tip cells, as they move, the cells at the back, which are called stalk cells, 
or sprouts or endothelial cells, they divide. And so they just divide as the cell, the tip cell moves. And in that way, you get this um, tube of cells forming. So the leaders are the tip cells that are doing a biased random walk up the gradient of VEGF. The followers are the endothelial cells. And instead of in the neural crest, where um, cells came into the domain from the neural tube, here this, the followers increase division. So then you've got these tracks moving along, but now in this case, it's very important that these meet because you need to form a loop in order to get flow. So they can form, they can crash like this, or they can crash like this. And that is called anastomosis. In fact, it turns out that the tip cells, as they move through the, through the extracellular matrix, they express many of the same genes that the neural crest leaders express in order to break down the tissue. So the classic model for this, a model we've all been using for the last 30 years, is a phenomenological model. It's a snail trail called the snail trail model. What it says is the following. Suppose that the tumor is here. Or sorry, suppose the tumor, suppose this is the tumor and this is the blood vessel. Let's consider the movement of the blood vessel cells in this direction. So here, N is the tip cell density. Here is diffusion. Here is chemotaxis, which is movement up the chemical gradient. C is the VEGF, for example. It's known that as the tip cells get close to the um, tumor, they branch, which means that one tip cell turns into two. So as the VEGF is higher near the tumor than away from the tumor, people model this by saying the branching rate increases with C. Then tip cells are lost if two tip cells collide. That's that term. And if a tip and a stalk cell collide, the tip cell is lost. And that's that term, where E is stalk cell. And then the endothelial, this is the gradient of a flux. And so if we think of the flux as being what induces the endothelial the followers to divide, we get this equation here, where this is a scaling factor. So that is the snail trail model. And in fact, what has, been, has done is people have taken that model, taken the 2D version of it, discretized it, and you see you get these nice networks as you increase in time. So what we decided to do was go the other way. We decided we will take a discrete description. So the, the description I just described, I just mentioned of cells they're moving up a biased random walk. The cells behind them are dividing. When cells interact with each other, they form loops. We decided we will take a two-dimensional square lattice and we will put those rules on top of the cells. So we will do this. We will fix the gradient of chemical to make life simple. And then what we will do is we will have a biased random walk for the cells. So under normal circumstances, if you were a cell in the lattice site IJ, then um, there would be, you'd have four neighbors, left, right, front, back. So there's a quarter probability you'll move front, 
quarter you'll move back, quarter you'll move left, quarter you'll move right. That's these ones here. But now we say this is biased by the gradient in the chemotractor. This term here, the gradient, moves up the gradient. Then we say that if you've got a tip cell here and the tip cell here, and the tip cell moves from there to there, they both become stalk cells. If a tip cell hits a stalk, stalk cell, they both become stalk cells. So we have these terms here. And then we have branching cell here, branches, and the branching rate depends on the chemical concentration. So what we get here is we get this. So we just run this model. And here are the um, cells. Here are the, the source of the cells. Here's the source of the VEGF. And now you see you get a network starting to form. Now we need to, this is a stochastic process. So to get the average, we run over many, many um, runs. Then we average in the x direction and this black gives you the tips and this black here gives you the stalks the red gives you the snail trail model and ignore the blue for the minute what you see here is the snail trail model perfectly captures the behavior of this discrete model so what we did then was we said, well, if we take our discrete model and go to a continuum by writing down a master equation and coarsening, then we'll get the snail tail model. Obvious, that's what's going to happen. So we start off in the usual way. We say that if I'm in IJ, how will the occupancy in IJ change? Well, it will change by neighbors moving in a certain probability probability of movement that'll be a plus this is neighbor coming in from um the right from the left this is coming in from the right this is coming in from the back coming in from the front so i've got these other way around this would be coming in from the back coming in from the front coming in from the side coming in from the side and this is moving out Okay, and then this is the tip to tip anastomosis, tip to stalk anastomosis, and this is branching. And then we do the same thing for the endothelial cells. Then we do the standard procedure of we go from this discrete points on the lattice to a continuum by doing the Taylor expansion. We then integrate the occupancies to get a one dimensional system, and this is what we get. So, big N is the um, tip density, big E is the stock density. And what you see is here is our model, and here is the snail trail model. Now, these terms are the same. But this term, this term is the same, but this term is different. Moreover, the, the equations for E are completely different. So we don't recover the snail trail model, we actually get a new model. So now we, and in doing this, with the snail trail model, it wasn't clear what assumptions were made because it was phenomenological. By doing this systematic derivation of this new model, we have made a number of assumptions. We've ignored spatial correlation and we've made mean field approximations. And we know that in some regimes, these are involved approximations. So now we have three models. We have the discrete model, which is sort of like the true model. We have classical model snail trail, 
and we have the blue model, our new model. And here is another example. And you see here the black line, the blue line, and the red lines all match. So what this means is not only are the PDEs a good description of the discrete model, but these two PDEs that are very different to each other give you the same result, which is surprising. Here's an example where the two PDE models give the wrong answer. The, act, the right answer is you start off like this, and then we've chosen parameter values such that in the agent-based model, the tip cells all coalesce and disappear. And then the stock cells, there's no more stock cells. The two PDEs predict you will still get the movement. And in fact, they both agree with each other. Now, with the classical snail trail model, we could not understand why this didn't work. But with our new model, we know why the models don't work. It's because of spatial correlation. We've made the assumption here that spatial correlation doesn't matter and that we can do a mean field approximation and the parameters we've chosen here are where these don't agree. So to summarize that piece of work, we found two very different PDEs that agree with each other. But we found that we know when the model does not agree with the real numerical data is when the mean field assumption and the spatial correlation independence break down. So what we've been doing recently with the graduate student Duncan Martinson is we've been trying to find out how come these two completely different looking PDEs give the same answer. And by doing a singular perturbation analysis, what we found is that in certain parameter regimes, these two models actually to leading order are the same. So if we find that these two models are the same to leading order, then we should use the simpler model, which is the classical snail trail. And what we can do with the parameter space in which these two models agree is that we can translate that into the biological scenario in which these two models agree. And then we can figure out under what conditions will these two models not agree. And they will not agree with each other if random movement is more dominant than directed movement and if branching becomes very important. So the importance of that work is that Traditionally in mathematical biology, people used phenomenological models like the phenomenological snail trail model. Now, the way people do this is very different. They do the way we did it. They start off with a discrete model and they coarse grain it and get a continuum model. Different approximations or assumptions at the discrete level give you different models at the continuum level, at the macroscopic level. And a major challenge in the field is how do you compare these two models? Because they're highly nonlinear. And what we've shown here is perhaps one methodology in which one could do this by looking at a perturbation and looking at leading order behavior. So leading order, some of these models that look very different might actually be the same. So what I will do there is end there and just to summarize the first part of the talk was looking at how do you, what mechanisms do you need to get collective cell movement? The second part of the talk 
was looking at a very different example of collective cell movement, but asking the question that if you make different detailed assumptions of the movement that lead to different PDEs, how do you test to see whether those PDEs agree with each other? So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Philip. So it's time to take uh, certain questions. Uh, okay. Shall I read it for you? Oh, yes, please. Thank you. Sure, sure. So, just a second. Yeah. So the first one is Is there any mathematical model that can predict the spina bifida to parents with history of similar congenial anomaly in a family or in case of lead? lead oblique mercury poisoning? I simply don't know the biology of um, spina bifida. So, I mean, an example, that's an example where um, obviously there is a um, um, something that, that's gone wrong in the structure. And so I, I simply don't know the biology of there. But one thing I thought would have been very important important in that is mechanics. And in fact, in our model, in both our models, we have not taken mechanics into account. We've just said a cell moves. We just say it moves from here to here. And we just do that in a rule. But of course, that movement will be due to mechanics. And one thing we've been doing recently, actually, we've just submitted a paper with colleagues in Barcelona Tomas Alicon and um, Daria Stefanova, what we've been looking at there is the mechanical aspects of angiogenesis. So I think that that's another whole area and challenge in mathematical biology is how do you take the mechanics of what's happening and combine it more with the chemistry of what's happening? So I can't, I'm sorry, I don't know the detail enough to be able to answer the question, but what I would suggest is that one would maybe need to look more at mechanics than that. Okay, okay. I'll take up the next one. Yeah. Uh, is there any correlation with physical exercise and neural crest cell movement? So that's the thing that what we're talking about here is happening very early in development. It's in the embryo. So it's so because these structures are forming while um, the 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 um, embryo is growing. These are embryonic structures that are forming, and once these structures are formed, because what will happen is that in the neurocrest cells that we're looking at, these cells when they reach the branchial arches, they will then differentiate. They will become the structure of the crania, cranial neural crest structure. And then what will happen then in terms of um, general exercise, for example, that's just presumably giving oxygen, um, helping cells to divide, but that's helping differentiated cells to divide. So that would make structures grow. But what we're looking at is how do the structures form in the first place? Okay. So those are two different okay. things. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so the next one is by Deborah Roop Roy. Can a feasible mathematical model of immune response to cancer be designed? Yes. So in fact, um, a lot of our colleagues in our department, and in fact, in many places, are precisely looking at that point. So they're looking at um, um, models of T cell and particularly of T cell infiltration of, of tumor um, cells. Um, and so tr models are of how are cells um, signaled so that they should move to a tumor? How do they then signal back so that more cells move to the tumor? And can you, by looking at a biopsy, see whether there's a good immune response happening? So this involves a lot of the processes that we've talked about, process of directed movement, so polarized movement, bias movement towards a target, 
division, um, death, which we didn't talk about, you know, the uh, immune cell killing the tumor cell, and the spatial pattern of the structure. Now, I didn't mention spatial pattern in my system because I was looking at the network of angiogenesis and saying, let's just look at density. But there's a lot of work done of looking at the topology and the spatial aspects of, of the network. And that's also going into immunology, looking at, can I look at the spatial distribution of the immune cells to see whether they're performing their job properly. There's a lot of work going on in there. Okay. Thank you. I'll take up the next one. Can all type of tumor cells be modeled with VEGF model? No, so the thing is that the, the VEGF is one example of what are called tumor angiogenesis factors. So I skipped through the picture very quickly, but there were other things there like BFGF basal um, fibroblast growth factor. So there are many different factors, and VEGF is one of them, but there are many different chemotactic factors, and some of them work, you know, they stimulate each other, etc. And that's also an area of research. How do these chemicals interact with each other? Okay, I'll take up the next one by Yukta. While the wound gets healed, new tissues are also formed like endothelial cells with new blood cells, but sometimes it forms a bulge on the skin. Can this bulge cause tumor cells to multiply and cause cancer? Okay, so the thing is that wound healing is a different process to tumor formation. When a when wound occurs, basically means that some of, you know, you've lost some cells, then what happens is the body is trying to um, uh, fill that up. So basically, you fill that up with normal cells. So cells have to divide, they have to move in, and then once the process is complete, those stimulus that told the cells to divide go away, and then the cells stop dividing. You can sometimes get scar formation or bulges, which is where that process um, is not so tightly regulated. And then it takes a longer time scale for that to go out. The tumor thing is a different thing. In a tumor, the cells have already lost. They do not respond to the signal because the tumor should not be dividing those cells there's no reason for them to divide. And the signal is sent to those cells, stop dividing, but they continue to divide. So they continue to divide, and then there's too many of them, and there's not enough oxygen. So they create their own blood supply. And then because the tumor angiogenesis, the, the um, blood vessels, are leaky to begin with, they're not well formed to begin with, the cells can invade and form secondary tumors. So the process of angiogenesis in wound healing is a normal response stimulated by normal cells. Tumor angiogenesis is abnormal cells stimulating the response. So although some of the processes are similar, the reason for them is different and the consequence is different. Okay, I'll take up the next one. Can time change of VEGF A concentration gradient leads new vasculoculture to steer like growth? To what like to? Leads new vasculature to steer like growth? Well, the thing is that, so with the vasculature, the, the model that I presented um, was actually the models that were developed, the snail trail models developed a long, long time ago. It's now becoming more obvious that there are other factors involved, not only other growth factors, but mechanical factors involved. And what you've got then is what, 
what the the signaling cues are doing is they are causing the cells to start moving towards them, but then there are shorter range um, signals that cause the cells to move towards each other to form loops, because you can only have blood flow if there's a closed loop. It's a lot of factors working together. Uh, in fact, what people do in order to um, test um, VEGF, I mean, the classical example is to look in the cornea in the eye, because in the cornea, there's no blood vessels in the cornea. So what you can do is if you were to place a pellet with VEGF in the center of the cornea, what happens is the VEGF diffuses to the rim of the, of the cornea where there are blood vessels, and those blood vessels then migrate up and go towards the tube, go towards the pellet. So in that way, you can see the VEGF stimulate the growth of the vasculature. Okay. Okay. So I'll take up the next one by Aviru. Is the same leader and follower phenomena work for leukocytes chemitoxis? But then how is the number of W species migrating to the particular site regulated? So I have to say that I I don't know the biology of, of that. So I don't know whether the same phenomenon is, is happening there. Um, but one, it does raise a very interesting point here, which is a point that we haven't yet addressed in our model. What we what we showed in our model was that if there were too many leaders, you did not get good a good enough movement. So there must be some sort of form of regulation of number of leaders, and that we don't know how that regulation is occurred. So in our model, we tend to fix the number of leaders, but that is a gross simplification. So, so you're absolutely right. There have to be other processes going on that regulate the number of leaders and the number of followers. And that might be just position, that depending where you are, you're a leader or a follower, rather than it being encoded at the beginning, because if it's encoded, then that means you don't have the flexibility to change in response to your environment. Okay. okay. So, uh, so there are three, four more questions. Okay. Uh, uh, first one, can you explain the need for basic assumptions, that is chemotactic and random branching in the two dimensional tip cell model of tumor induced angiogenesis? Okay, so the first thing is that it's observed, like I mentioned in the um, in that corneal um, wound healing or corneal um, experiment, where when you put the VEGF in the center of the cornea, it creates a gradient, and you see the cells moving up the gradient, and in so the tumor cells or the endothelial cells are moving up the chemical gradient. So the chemotaxis is definitely happening. What's also noticed is something called the brush border effect, which is that as the vasculature gets closer to the tumor, you see a big increase in the branching happening. And people have proposed that that's because of an increase in VEGF, because there's more VEGF there. But I'm sure it's more complicated than that, that why it is that the branching increases as you get closer to the VEGF. So these are two phenomena that are observed experimentally that are included in the models. Okay. The next one by Elora Sane and Deberoop Roy. So I'm combining the two questions. Does the okay. leader follower trail also exist under condition of mechanical stress in traumatic brain injury? And second, will the mathematical models differ with different physiologies of human or animals? Okay, so the first thing is, again, what we're talking about is very early 
development. So we're, we're not talking about um, the adult where there is an injury that occurs. But one thing I would say that's very important in all of this is that we have said that the, in our model, we said, well, maybe the follower sticks to the leader. But we could get the same type of behavior, the leader creating a mechanical, a mechanical um, signal, because as cells move, they exert forces on the matrix. And what this can do is it can align the matrix and create corridors that help cells to move. In fact, the recent paper that we've done, our colleagues showed that in the early neurocrest, the cells make a tunnel. They physically make a hole in the, in the, in the um, domain so that other cells can move more easily along there. So there's absolutely no doubt that mechanical aspects are really, really important. And the second question about relating this across different species is a very, very good question because I mentioned that there are different neural crests. So in each animal, the different neural crest, whether it be gut, whether it be cranial, use different mechanisms. I showed that in the gut, it was proliferation driven in the chick, but in the, um, in the neural crest, it seems to be driven by this sort of leader follower thing. But in different species, the processes seem to be different. So it's, it's the same type, each, in each case, the same type of thing has to be done, but it can be done in different ways, in different species. Okay. So I'll take up the second last question. Are mathematical models applied in case of targeted drug delivery? Yeah, so very much. So, I mean, it's not an area that I work in, but certainly the pharmaceutical companies are very interested in working. I mean, we have a number of collaborations where we have graduate students supervised um, with pharmaceutical companies where they're looking precisely at this type of problem of what properties should um, a drug possess in order for it to have maximum effect. And then you can do that in a mathematical context. And then, of course, the question then is how you design the drug that has those properties. So that's very much a growth area. OK, that comes to the last question. How can the complex vascular structure of tissue and the network of blood vessels supplying nutrients to a solid tumor mass embedded in the tissue be modeled? That's the part one. Second. Can capillaries be considered one dimensional within a three dimensional tissue domain for mathematical modeling? Okay, so the first thing is that what we in the model that, that I um, mentioned, we simply looked at density. So that's why we, we modeled this, a density. So we're basically saying that in a domain, what is the density? But we have done models as of many, many other people of actually putting in the vascular structure. So there are models out there of um, three dimensional vessel structures where you have um, angiogenesis occurring, you have oxygen then diffusing from the blood vessels into the tissue and the cells in the tissue growing. There are many problems with such models in terms of trying to compare them with experimental data, simply because it's very difficult to get three dimensional data on, um, on vasculature. But this is now beginning to happen. So this is a um, very, very good area in which to be going in because the technology of the medical technology is getting to the stage where you can actually see these things. The computational technology of modeling is getting to the stage where you can actually do these models. So we have a software, it's called MicroVessel Chased, 
which is precisely to do this. It's to model the, the network. And then in terms of the capillary, of course, a capillary is not a one dimensional straight line, it's actually a tube, and so which has got tortuosity. And that can be modelled. So people have done, including ourselves, have done quite sophisticated models of tubes where within the tube you've got flow, but within the flow you also model the cells, the blood, the, the blood um, cells that are carrying the, um, the red blood cells that are carrying the oxygen, the hematocrit. So one can actually model those cells moving through the um, tubes carrying the, um, the, the oxygen. So you can get down to that level of detail. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Philip. Uh, that that okay. brings thank to you. an end of our question answer session. And I really would like to thank you that you have taken up all the questions till the very last and to the satisfaction of all the attendees. And I would like to share it with you that there were around 330 attendees uh, okay. who have attended your talk. And I would like to thank you. I would like to thank all the attendees. And I would like to thank uh, all my colleagues, as well as uh, Professor Ajoy Katak, who is the chairperson of the National Academy of Sciences India Delhi chapter, as well as our college administration, who have helped me all throughout uh, in organizing these webinars. Any any concluding remarks from your side? Then I'll close the session. Well, so again, would like to thank you for organizing this, and I'd like to thank people for listening to this on a Saturday, and also for the questions because all these questions were absolutely um, very very important questions, and I think what the questions illustrated is also a point that I'm trying to get across because although they were in lots of different areas that I know nothing about, you can see that the similar mechanisms must be happening. And this is something that mathematical modeling can do. Mathematical modeling can say that if I want a group of cells to move from one place to another, what is important? There must be a directed movement, there must be a signal, there must be a control of speed, et cetera, et cetera. And then that gives you something to look for. So you can go into these different areas and you can say, what is the signal that's making these things? There must be a signal that's giving polarity. Could be mechanical, could be chemical. There must be something that signals from one cell to another. Could be chemical, could be mechanical, etc. And the different processes will use different mechanisms but the mathematical modeling gives you the overarching general theory of what mechanisms must be involved and the detail of the biology. And that's where you must work with biologists because the biologists will tell you by working with them how those mechanisms can be attained biologically.